My name is Joel Vasallo. I'm the manager of cloud DevOps at Redbox. So um, in short, that means anything that goes to the cloud, usually me and my team are responsible with that. It goes from architecture, networking, uh, Kubernetes, you name it. So we're there. And I'm uh, Nick Canesco. I'm the manager of the mobile apps. Cool. So uh, our talk is called Delivering Software Like a Fox. But before we do that, uh, we want to give you a little bit of heads up. How many people in the room know Redbox? Sure, yeah, Redbox. How many people know that we have a streaming platform? Exactly, look at that. It's like everyone's hands go down. <laughs> uh, it's great. Um, no, so uh, in the past year or two, we've kind of kicked, uh, it's actually now a year and a half or so, uh, we launched Redbox On Demand. It's our newest, latest streaming platform. Ball built on .NET Core, in containers, on Linux, in the cloud. Uh, .NET Core is actually pretty cool. Uh, I never thought I would say that being a Java person myself, but it's good. Um, containers, Kubernetes, Google Cloud, AWS, etc. So <clears throat> in building this platform, we had a few missions in mind, right? We had three things that we really wanted to accomplish. First off, we wanted to modernize our software development processes. Um, not, nothing wrong with the way they were done, but in the sense that the world has really come a long way from traditional Windows servers running in a data center, running .NET frameworks and stuff like that. Uh, we really wanted to empower developers to use containers. Uh, speed up feature delivery, um, and mainly to the cloud. Uh, so uh, in, this slide, in this section, we also wanted to leverage the power of the cloud, have the scaling perspective of the cloud. We wanted to be in the cloud, you know, as everyone wants to be uh, nowadays. Um, with that, we also wanted to ensure that our features go out the door faster, because in the streaming business, it's all about being first to market with your features, getting out there as fast as possible. And the last thing um, that's a little bit radical is we wanted to empower our developers to own their applications. Now, this doesn't mean that developers can create Git repos. This doesn't mean that developers can create Git groups. This means that a developer can, at any time, deploy code to production with a single click of a button, including PCI and SOX. So developers write code. The tooling picks up the slack. Code goes out the door based on an approval process. Developers are able to, uh, to uh, own and operate their code, essentially. So it's a little bit of a radical thought, but we'll get into that. So when we started, um, we had to put the version in version control. Uh, Nick has been here at Redbox for about almost a year and a half. Myself, less than a year, or well, yeah, less than a year now. Um, when we both got here, we noticed there was a disparate amount of Git and source control tools. Uh, namely, we had an internal Git server which I don't know what it was actually running. We had github.com. We had Team Foundation Server. We had Azure DevOps. Uh, so <laughs> all this stuff, teams were really all over the place, right? They, they all had their source code. Getting access to things were just a nightmare. So what did we do? Let's get another version control system into the mix. We need a fifth one. <laughs> so we picked GitLab. <laughs> but why, right? Um, all the solutions were great. They all probably have their own pitfalls, but they also have their own pitfalls. Namely, the internal Git server, you're running Git. You are the, you are the GitLab, you, whoever that team is running that, right? GitHub.com, it's great, but it really still didn't feel like an organizational connection. There was no way of really teams owning their own software. So that was great, but didn't really work that well. Team Foundation server, it's, it was an older version. It was also very tightly coupled to a lot of business processes. So making changes on source control meant you're changing things in like uh, project management stuff. And you're like, well, why does this commit break that? And I, yeah, I don't know how this works. And Azure DevOps, um, honestly, it was just too new. Uh, I don't know where Microsoft is going to go with this. Literally, when I joined, Azure DevOps was announced, I think, in September 2018. So we still don't, I don't know if it's good or not. So I haven't looked at it. Um, honestly, GitLab was the most tried and true solution from our perspective. Um, it had support for a few things like on-prem, uh, also in the cloud as well on the .com offering. But as, and more than that, um, it at the end of the day let developers kind of control their namespace within a larger organization, and I'll touch on that later. So the beginning, um, I'll move this over slightly. Uh, so the mobile teams were the first ones to get to try out GitLab.com. That's where we started. Um, and here's some of the reasons why we picked it. Uh, for one, it's simple. Um, it's extremely easy to get started. There's a lot of documentation out there. Um, all the things I love. Um, it's very cost effective. We were able to get up free trial running, uh, get 
you know, get repos up, open, uh, test out different things, different features to see if it could work for our teams. A lot of what we were doing was trying to see if a new tool could work for us at Redbox. Um, one of the things we were looking for specifically though was workflow management, um, issue tracking. We were using all different issue tracking as well besides just Git. Um, no one knew where any ticket was, everyone had a different process, it was difficult to understand where anything was, and we wanted something really simple. Uh, but most importantly for me was the GitLab runners, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. So uh, our steps to migrating. Uh, coming from github.com, there's a very simple process. It's called import repository. <coughs> Click that button. <laughs> uh, it does everything. Here's a little bit better representation of what that is. We click the import button. GitLab does magic. And then we're there. <laughs> simple. So now getting on to the GitLab CI and runners. Um, so why this was so important to us. Um, we can see here it's free and easy to set up. I've used Jenkins before specifically for mobile development. Um, it works, it's a fantastic tool. But in the end, as an app developer, I'm mostly focused on building apps, not maintaining Jenkins and different things like that. Um, doing all the different updates and just like I said, it's, it's just easier for app developers to focus on building their apps. Um, specifically with iOS development, um, we had to build everything off of a Mac. So we have several Mac minis that we run off of. So we were able to hook up to GitLab.com and basically register our Mac minis as runners. We don't use the shared runners that are out there because we really can't do it for iOS specifically. So what this enables us to have is basically we have GitLab runners for free, aside from the cost for the Mac minis. Uh, so we maintain those and basically it's just really easy to use. Um, there's a very developer friendly YAML in our source control, which is basically how we build our pipelines and our step-by-step -step process. And our whole build process is in the code. It's in version control. Everyone can access it, everyone can see it, it's easy to read. Um, and this really is kind of the definition of how our team works, which is also something that's really important. Uh, not just documenting it in Confluence or something like that, we can actually go to a direct source and say this is exactly how our team will work and this is what we're doing. So speaking on easy to use, this is actually uh, a snippet out of our, our YAML here. Probably not the best naming for things, but either way, uh, we have, this is called unit test feature from push. I thought that was simple enough. Um, so <laughs> we, we're, we're unit testing uh, basically any feature branch or bug branch um, in our code. Um, so every single time a developer pushes their code up, we're gonna run a test on it. Um, and with this YAML, you can see here, it's pretty simple. Um, tells us what, what the stage is called, uh, what script we're actually performing here. We use a tool called Fastlane that just automates a lot of the really long, you know, bash scripty stuff that we have to do into a simple thing called Fastlane unit test. Really easy to see. Um, and we can define things like where it's gonna run, like our tags, um, when it's gonna run. Here's our feature or our bugs. These are when it's, these things are gonna run. And then there's also these exceptions, which really I didn't realize when I first get, got started how important they are, but they're really, really important and powerful. So the next real question is, but why? <laughs> why do this? Why do CICD on mobile? The simplest answer is go faster, right? Everyone wants to go faster. Everyone wants to deliver faster. The business wants to go faster. When I started, we, the mobile teams were doing a three week sprint. There was two weeks straight of development where several developers just put all of their code into one common branch. We made one release, one build, and QA went through that one build, which is okay. But what if my code breaks Joel's code? Do we know that? Do maybe, you know that? Maybe three weeks from now we'll find out. It, is, whose fault is that? It's yours. It's, it's, no, it's yours. No, it's yours. Okay, so here's some of the problems that we ran into is where, where are the issues? Everything's all together. There's no isolation between branches, between tickets, between any of our work. What this often led to was we couldn't release on time or at all. Um, there were many times this happened. Uh, it caused a lot of issues. So when I came in, I said, I want to go to one week sprints. Everyone thought I was crazy. I think they still do. Um, but, <laughs> yes, thank you, Joe. Um, but a lot of the concern came around, what, what is the QA process? Because there were, everyone was very used to this one week long uh, time of just doing QA. How are we going to do one week of QA and development? How are we going to do this? It seems like you don't care about QA. And it's actually the opposite. Um, 
the whole goal of this is to basically ingrain quality into every step that we do. In the YAML that I showed before, we, every time we push on a feature or bug branch, we're running our tests, unit and UI tests. We only saw the unit uh, portion of that. Uh, before we ever merge in any code, we're running tests. After we merge in code, we test it again. We do, we do nightly regressions. All, so we're constantly testing our code. And what does this allow us to do? This gives us a higher level of confidence in the code that we deploy. So I can sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's simple. We, we all want to write code in a safe way. Um, so that way we, we feel confident that it's, when it goes out to a customer, it's going to work. And what that allows us to actually do is it allows us to go much faster. So what if it doesn't work? What if I push that code, I do, do all the right things, I test everything, and I still break something? Because I know I've done this quite a few times. Um, we can do uh, up here is uh, bug fix releases or emergency releases. Um, this happened shortly after I actually got all of GitLab.com CI/CD runners going. Uh, we discovered an issue. Um, once we detected the issue, we resolved the issue, and within one button push, we deployed to the App Store. Um, all in all, it was I think it was under 15 hours to actually deploy into a customer's hands. And now for iOS, that's incredibly fast because of the sort of notorious app review process. So if we were doing this on Android, it could have been a few hours. Yep. And here's just a quick, um, these are our, all our builds that we've done on iOS specifically. Um, this is at the enterprise level, not at GitLab.com. Yep. Um, so as you can see, all our builds were, were actually steadily increasing. And on this last month in May, yep. Uh, the number for iOS was 498 um, uh, builds that we ran on Android, which isn't pictured here. We had just over 400, so we're just under a thousand builds a month, and I'm sure it's going to keep increasing, increasing, and we're going to use it more and more. Nice. <laughs> cool. So uh, GitLab.com, it was great, uh, but from my perspective, I was uh, when I started, I had to think larger. So Nick did a great job pioneering it for the mobile team. In fact, it was a great use case of showing the ability to run faster on the mobile side. The next question was, can we do this for everyone else? The answer is yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> so why GitLab Enterprise? Uh, you know, they have GitHub Enterprise, you have Bitbucket, who else is in, I don't know, everyone else is in this space. Really? Uh, easy, uh, there's the ease of migration back and forth between GitLab.com and also GitLab Enterprise, which I'll touch on. Security and source control. Um, you know, I, I trust uh, all the folks at GitLab, at GitHub, any one of these companies to do it. But at the end of the day, um, knowing that I have my source control encrypted, locked down behind whatever firewall I may own and need to do, um, and ultimately have due diligence over how that code is shared, it lets us and our compliance teams sleep better at night. Um, in addition to this, um, SAML, we had our own corporate login system, so we, uh, it integrated a little bit nicer. Um, and ultimately, we were able to control our infrastructure, right? We paid for what we needed at the time. Uh, if you need more servers, you had more servers, you need less, you need less. Um, as well as uh, fine green controls, uh, the thing that it afforded us were repository insights and metrics, as you saw in a previous slide by Nick, um, empowering developer ownership. Um, I may be on the DevOps team, but I am not a Git admin. I give Nick admin over his team, and Nick can work with his team to figure out if he needs one or a thousand repos. That's ultimately, I trust him as a developer and lead to do that with his team. Um, and then ultimately, uh, customized infrastructure support within, uh, it, we'll touch on that in a bit too. So when I say ease of migration, um, code initially was on GitLab.com and private repos, as Nick was showing. So uh, the migration steps were a little complicated, but first off, you connect your GitLab.com account to your GitLab Enterprise. You click this Import All button, and you just monitor it, and it's done. So I know it was a little bit of a confusion there, but it's uh, three steps. Uh, you basically <laughs> connect your account, click a button, magic happens. Um, this brings in all the issues. It brings all your history. It brings your branches. It brings any of your uh, issue tracker, anything that you may have done on the GitLab.com. Again, ease of migration, that's part of the reason we went with GitLab is that they, they really didn't care where we ran. Run it on GitLab.com if you want to be in a, self, in a provided environment. If you need to run it on-prem, no problem, run it there. If you need to go back, you just import it back. It's very easy to go back and forth. Security and infrastructure control, as I alluded to. Um, 
we um, initially had a strong support for SAML, and I think it wasn't until the last two releases that SAML got a lot better on GitLab.com, so this story may not be as accurate right now. Um, but when we started, we had our own IDP. Um, for those that are not in for folks in that, it's, we had our own SAML provider, and we had to kind of connect back into our data center for that. Um, so we needed a little bit more fine-grained control on that. Um, granular access, giving developers access to control their repositories, add deploy keys, add hooks, whatever they need. Um, logs and metrics collection, um, you know, when were commits coming in, when were they going out, we needed access to the API, um, and uh, ultimately we wanted to encrypt all our software, um, you know, with encryption keys and stuff like that. And stuff like that. Um, developer ownership. Uh, I alluded to this earlier, but a lot of uh, software as a service solutions, um, they have this concept of one uh, organization is your top level organization. By that I mean, um, if you go to like, uh, like for example, one of these other Git providers, they'll say it'll be like a Google or a Redbox, and then every repo is under there. This is great, but then you kind of lose this visibility into Teams. You have, uh, for example, Redbox, Redbox Mobile iOS, Redbox Mobile Android, not bad. You add in two other verticals into that. Redbox DevOps something. Redbox DevOps this. You're scrolling through this giant list of just repos, and there's no real way of classifying this. Sure, there's back-end ways of saying this team sees these repos, but in terms of actually just getting a nice experience for that team, it's hard to find that. So that's one of the biggest things that I personally liked. Um, development teams lost control of this. Uh, a lot of the other tools out there require that there is a Git admin. I don't want to be a Git admin. Developers know how to use Git. It's part of their day-to-day -day workflow. Um, and then centralized provisioning. Uh, this kind of go into this. Someone had to be a Git admin. And then ultimately, something that's actually pretty cool about GitLab is the concept of um, templates, template repositories. You can create a number of base template repositories. For example, um, .NET Core, Java, and uh, iOS. And then when the developer's creating the repository in the GUI, they can actually reference that sample repository that you created as their base. So for example, this is, we use this on the DevOps team because we have things like um, default uh, permissions Jenkins files, uh, GitLab CI default files, um, any readmes that we may need. Uh, developer can just clone that and have a default readme and then just edit to their specification and boom, they're set up into the standard of the company, which is actually pretty cool. So yeah, part of developer ownership. Um, now this is kind of where I split off. You're saying, whoa, wait a second, why is Jenkins up there? This is a GitLab event. Shouldn't that be GitLab CI? No. Um, this is honestly one of the best things about GitLab is they just want us to be successful, right? Batteries are included. There's a lot of great tools in there, such as GitLab CI, the Git, GitLab issue board, which Nick used on the GitLab.com, GitLab's artifact repository. It's built into the platform. GitLab's pipelines with the CI CD process. All of this comes in, but if you don't want to use it, it'll adapt to your business model. For example, my team uses Jenkins. We can still use GitLab. There's no blocking event where it says, ooh, you're using Jenkins. You can't talk to us. The error, you know, blocked. No, we use Jira. We tie Jira tickets into GitLab all the time. We have JFrog Artifactory. We also use Spinnaker for our software delivery. Again, it's transform it transforms to what you need as a business. And that's the thing that I really appreciate being on the DevOps side. So getting to delivering fast. Um, this is kind of more so on the aspect of the server side. Uh, mobile is a little bit different because you have the App Store review process. This is kind of more of how we deliver into our cloud environment. So, Really, it starts with a git commit, which goes into GitLab. GitLab CI on merge requests creates a uh, container out of that, and developers can pull that, test that out locally, whatever they may need to do. Uh, master commits go to Jenkins, which also may do things, uh, build code, and push <laughs> it to the Docker registry, which happens to be in JFrog Artifactory, which a new container is created, and our tool, um, Spinnaker, uh, deploys it out to um, Kubernetes, Jugu Cloud, AWS, um, but yeah. So what does this look like in practice in terms of what is Spinnaker? Spinnaker is essentially a multi-cloud uh, wrapper around uh, deployments. We aren't just in Kubernetes, we are in AWS, we are also in some workloads in GCP. So this alludes to, we have a complex business process not only of our uh, GitLab perspective, but also our, um, our, our requirements. So we bake a new image, 
infrastructure step, this is where developers, uh, load balancers, firewalls, DNS records, all this stuff gets auto provisioned for them. Developers don't have to be infrastructure administrators. We tag back whenever we're done deploying uh, into dev, back to developers, deploy to dev, run quality tests, tag, and attach a scaling policy so you can increase and decrease your server loads. Not too much on that. Um, when it goes to Kubernetes, we still have ties into GitLab. Um, in fact, there's actually native ties between Spinnaker and GitLab, which is great because of the open API. We're actually able to write Python scripts, uh, .NET Core scripts to actually tie into GitLab's API and use it in our CICD process. Again, two separate tools, but we're still tying them together, which is awesome from my perspective as a DevOps administrator, uh, DevOps <coughs> manager. Uh, we have our Canary. We deploy our Canary. A, ca uh, a Canary config gets applied. We do our automated Canary analysis. If that goes well, we deploy to prod. That goes out the door and runs quality tests and generates change requests. Um, we tie this all back together with our Istio service mesh. And it basically looks like something like this. That config step basically looks like, hey, if the headers match Joel, that's me, uh, go to the version 2. Otherwise, go to version 1. Um, that's kind of Istio and a kind of a whirlwind tour uh, from a routing perspective. But when we do our canaries, we're able to actually do complex canaries such as take our default production um, endpoint, create a copy of that, create another copy of our latest canary, and then do analysis on that. You're probably wondering, well, why did you deploy the same service twice? Um, talking to a few friends from Netflix, it's actually a pretty cool concept. Um, that server may have been running for two weeks. The metrics that that server generates may be completely different than a brand new server and its memory profile. So by spinning up a fresh server of a copy of the one that's existing, along with your latest canary, you're able to do complex query and uh, canary analysis across and generate ultimately a score. And it looks something like this. Again, things like, hey, it passed the CPU profile. It didn't pass the 50th, uh, latency in the 50th percentile. It also failed the, the successful request rate. And it couldn't handle enough TCP connections in you know, comparison to the previous canary. So you can say, do you want to continue or fail this? And yeah, that's part of it. So we did a kind of a whirlwind tour on this. And that kind of was a little bit of a detour. But um, to recap, we went with GitLab because we wanted to modernize our software development processes. How did we do that? That was with GitLab CI, leveraging also Fastlane. Again, power of GitLab <coughs> along with other tools. We wanted to increase software delivery um, and do what's best for the teams, right? I don't want to dictate what developers should do in their day-to-day -day workflow. So GitLab CI and Spinnaker. And ultimately, developers own their own apps. Um, GitLab Enterprise allowed teams to kind of own their own verticals, as well as uh, Spinnaker allows them to deploy it to whatever cloud provider that they so choose. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for coming and listening to our talk. Uh, we'll be around if you have any questions at the end. Uh, if you are looking for a new uh, 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 job, we're also hiring as well. We have a ton of uh, looking for .NET developers as well as DevOps and data ops as well, doing some pretty cool stuff. So check us out. <laughs>